When it comes to business, for most of us, it's war. War is the most commonly used metaphor in business. We strategize campaigns against competitive opponents. We gather intelligence, follow protocols, have tactics, launch things. We crush and kill our goals. Now, what seems like semantics actually begs the question. If business is war, and war is typically a no-holds-barred-to-the-death kind of thing, where do we draw the ethical lines around our behavior? In the fog of war, the delineation between right and wrong becomes misty, indistinct, and for good reason. War can force honorable people to behave dishonorably. So the fog is necessary. It provides cover. What choice did we have? Who's to say who's right and who's wrong? Now imagine this fog descends on the law firm. Are your boundaries defined? Ethically, what are you prepared to do when it comes to growing your business? Whatever it takes. No matter the cost. That's what we're talking about today on Lawsome. Ethics in marketing law firms and where we draw the digital lines that define how our businesses behave. Let's go. Lawsome. The podcast for law firms. Powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawsome, the only podcast for law firms that will leave you with a song in your step and a spring in your heart. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in personal and professional developments. I am Jake Sanders, holistic veterinarian. And with me is our chief surgeon of SEO, Paul Julius. Paul? How much St. John's wort is too much for a horse, you think? Are you asking for a friend again? (laughs) I'm not asking for me. I'm asking for a friend. Thank you for that caveat. I keep forgetting that caveat. (laughs) It's for a friend. It's not for me. It's for for my friend. Uh, Anyway, for my friend, tell us what's on the show today. All right, friends. On the show... Uh, today we talk about digital ambulance chasing with an article from NPR.org. We discuss marketing tactics and strategies that can help lawyers stay above the ethical gray zones. And we place me, Lawson's very own Paul Julius, on the hot bench for 10 questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. The article today is from NPR.org. Uh, it's titled Digital Ambulance Chasers? Law firms send ads to patients' phones inside ERs. <laughs> oh, man. This would shock me if I didn't actually do this. I've actually yeah, done this. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> this would totally shock me, and I'd be what like, else is new? <laughs> this is horrible. This is horrible news. Um, and the only reason I say that is because it didn't work when I did it. Yeah. Uh, so I, w- did you have success with your geofencing campaigns? No, <laughs> no, no. So, um, well, what's, what's your, I, I gotta tell you, I'm not really disappointed. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. If it had worked, I'd be more sad. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, aside from digital fraud and, and all this stuff, what's your hot take on this issue specific? Um, PI lawyers using digital uh, targeting methods to kind of get some clicks. What, what's your, what's your hot take on this article? Uh, this one, I think. When you look at the end, the end of the article, um, Mm -hmm. the guy says I was targeted and it's supposed to be my privacy as a patient. They shouldn't know that I was there. Like, are we talking about like how, how close are we getting to just standing there taking pictures of people going in and out of, you know, an emergency room? Like Mm. when, where's this privacy line and, and, and what's okay to cross and what's not okay to cross. Right. And it, well, I think we're just in the beginnings of this. I think the more consumers are aware of how their data is handled online, the more consumer confidence comes up, the, the more difficult it's going to be for advertisers to kind of get these um, short-term results because may, maybe this does work. Maybe there is someone in the ER who isn't aware of their recourse and then sees that and then you click on it. And then, I mean, sure, it could happen. It could be great. One of the things I I don't think that is made clear in this is that everyone 
in the hospital is getting this ad. Mm -hmm. I can't target it to certain people's phones. So a doctor is getting a a personal injury ad, a a nurse, uh, the janitor, then all the people that are there for non-injury related things. And then on top of that, the small portion of people who went there for an auto accident, you know, I mean, really? You, this this is where you want to you you really want to spend your time creating advertisements, to, it's, yeah, to be served in this way. It's not the the pinpoint precision <sighs> that uh, I think it's it's kind of made out to be here. Uh, you're right. still trying to find a specific needle in a stack of needles that people are dumping more needles on. You know, right? So. And, and it's a needle exchange, and there's biohazard you know, considerations. <laughs> yeah. And- <laughs> yeah, actually, that was a really bad metaphor to use for this. Sorry, <laughs> but no, it, it's it's a great metaphor because it it outlines the kind of um, you think that you found a way to specifically target someone. No, you haven't. You uh-huh. found. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, you you haven't done that, and and even when you have done that, it still matters what you say and how you say it. So my, my take is, is, and I think the free rides are coming to an end as far as geofencing is concerned. Regulations could be coming. Uh, the stuff that's happening in the EU, people are getting more serious about that. There's tons of lawsuits in, in Germany. In, uh, there's a lawsuit that you just mentioned earlier today uh, uh, about Facebook using pictures from some of their users without their consent. So yeah. I'm using your geographic information without your consent. I'm going to look at your emails without your consent and see if you type the word DiGiorno's in there. And then I'm going to send you a pizza ad on Twitter. You know, this stuff has been happening. But I think as more people are becoming savvy to it, lawyers need to stop focusing. You know, if you're going to be doing digital advertising, maybe stop focusing on the the tactical nature of it and focus on how you are saying what you're saying. Because I think if you keep going for these geofencing, retargeting, um, those kind of short-term wins, there's ethical considerations and long-term damage. And you talked about this uh, later in the interview about the perception of lawyers. Mm-hmm. Is Are these small couple of clicks worth that? And you have to really start asking those questions. Well, with this too – I really like what the uh, the attorney general, the Massachusetts attorney general says in this, where she says private medical information should not be exploited in this way, especially when it's gathered secretly without a consumer's knowledge, without knowledge or consent. So I guess the and this is one of these gray areas that we're going to talk about later is Mm -hmm. just by walking into an ER. Is that now private medical information? Mm. Like where, what's that line? I know, I know I want, you know, if I'm doing this kind of targeting, I want to target people who have been injured, Mm -hmm. but really, like you said, I'm covering the entire hospital. And, you know, if I happen to reach somebody who, you know, might need legal services for an accident they just recently had, lucky me. That's just one kind of way, you know, if you want to move this into just one big blurry area that's kind of one way to look at it yeah yeah and i think i think it is all blurry because it's it's these i think it's dance steps to a a dance that it's like the macarena it's it's like knowing the macarena now is less of a problem than it was in the late 90s if you didn't Mm. know the macarena you weren't plugged in you know, but I think nowadays you, you, no one really knows that. I think we have to be careful of how we change our marketing to chase advertising strategies that might be disappearing in the future. Well, and it's, yeah, definitely. And it's one of those kind of things too, where I, I think a lot of this stuff, particularly the way it's presented in this article is going to come across a couple of years from now, you know, like you said, I mean, the Macarena is a good example, but like more in the digital um, world would be like, you know, uh, spammy link building, mm-hmm. you know, private blog networks, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Like things like these short term tricks to get you rankings that just, uh, you know, like once everybody, you know, once Google found out about it, like that's it, you know, and if you see it, you still see people trying. It's like, 
no, everybody knows about that. That's not going to work. Yeah, my uh, my my metaphor really is is that I think if you want to pursue uh, advertising, you need to have a balanced plate. And yeah. I think these short term hits, uh, these little bits of digital that we can sprinkle in, they're more of like the sugar. And uh, that brand positioning, your 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 core values, uh, the the places where you come from. That's the broccoli. Those are the proteins. Um, so I think a lot of people just have a bunch of sugar on their plates and they're thinking mm. that they're eating and you feel like you are, but you don't get the long-term energy because you're not investing in a long-term strategy. You're just chasing fools, you know? So uh, that's, that's yeah. just my thought is, is yeah. that it's another, it's another thing, uh, to be thrown on the idea pile, um, and someone had to do it. We've done it. I've done this. Yeah, me too. Didn't get a good click through. It felt weird, felt snaky, stopped doing it. And now, just because everyone's being more cognizant of this, I think we're going to see more of this. And it's not just personal injury lawyers. Um, it's it's going to be all businesses chasing all types of weird data points um, just to see if you'll click on a crappy ad. You know, it's like, man, you know what? Do something more valuable. If if you're going to reach out to someone like this, do a TV commercial, do a radio commercial, go big, you know, and then reach everyone because you think that you're being specific with these things, but you're not. And you can't tie it back into being specific um, yeah. unless that person gives you their information, you get the cookie on them and then you can follow them wherever, you know, but. It's something I've been thinking about too, is that just the context and not and, and i mean like where you are and and, and i know hmm. let me explain a little bit like mm -hmm. a lot of times when you're on the publishing side of a website like you own the website and you have ad space you can tick off categories that you don't want advertising gambling you know alcohol right you whatever you know so and a lot of, and you know a lot of newspapers tick the legal one um for sure but think about this like if you're talking about a hospital Everybody's seen those digital billboard or the digital directories that hospitals have. Do you think they would let a lawyer advertise there? From the hospital's perspective, they are probably like, I don't want to see this stuff here either. Well, let me tell you that I did an advertising campaign with somebody called Med Center Displays, and they specifically show lawyers' ads in hospital waiting rooms. And I created the ad, it had to be specific, but I couldn't say certain things. Couldn't mm -hmm. talk about medical conditions. I couldn't talk about um, the phrasing had to be very specific. We created it. Nothing happened, by the way. Nothing happened. No no calls came in from the tracking number or whatever. But it's interesting because you you have this idea. Hospitals don't want that. Yeah, they do. Private run hospitals trying to make money. They realized, oh, these screens are just doing what? Maybe we can throw some ads on there. I couldn't show pictures of pills. I couldn't show pictures of cars, wrecked cars, people hurt. You know, you, you have to be very specific about that. And they've kind of boxed you into this way. And and we were really intrigued by it because we said, hey, if I can impart some nice little bit of advice here or there, or, you know, a little bit of counsel saying, hey, if you want more, call me, um, we can do it. But they boxed us into this place where we couldn't say what we really did. We couldn't say what we really wanted. So we're just kind of talking at them in this very general way. It's odd because the restrictions of advertising are creating bad advertising because no one wants to go against the restrictions. So then we'll just go with whatever we can. And so we'll chase people wherever they are. And it's just dangerous. It's just dangerous because you're not focused on what makes you unique. You're not focused on what makes you special. Why yeah. should people call you? A good ad would tell them that. You know, right, right. You're focused on getting to the place as opposed to what you're going to say once you get there. Oh, ex oh my God. You're absolutely right. This is a great metaphor. It's, it's, it's all, it's all, um, theoretical whiteboarding stuff, but what if it really happens? You mm -hmm. don't have anything to deliver on the other end of that. So yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but we, we go further into this in our interview. We talk about geofencing in particular, uh, the different types of targeting available for digital advertising and how marketers, um, and folks working for law firms can create better ads and then get better results from their advertising campaigns. Uh, so we have that all coming up on a very special episode of Lawsome. So stay tuned.
Stay tuned. Stay tuned for more goodness from Lawson after this message. We really have a relationship with Consult Webs that goes beyond simple business to business marketing. Uh, we have grown up with them as a company. They were there for us when we started. We were there for them when they started. So I think that we were Consult Web's first personal injury client 15 or 16 years ago. I've been working with them directly for 10 years now, and they've always been a fantastic partner. It's vitally important to us that when somebody says you should hire Bellic and Fox, and they go to the Bellic and Fox website, they're going to go beyond the website and contact us. They understand storytelling, they understand technology, they understand a website isn't just text on a page, it's how you create an expectation for what that means to, to work with us. When we get a case, they are very excited in a really genuine way that I think reflects the fact that they sort of view their success tied to ours. Um, so that's, that's why we continue to use them. I've never had anything but praise for how they've been, been able to market our website. Go to consultwebs.com to learn more. Let's head over to the Lawson Roundtable with Paul and Jake. All right, Paul. So we're going to talk about geofencing. So can you, as the digital advertising specialist that you are, lay out a short summary of what geofencing or situation-specific targeting is in digital advertising? Sure. There's kind of a lot of terms that get thrown around, and, and I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. So I'm going to throw out a couple different definitions. So you have geofencing, you have mm -hmm. geotargeting, you have retargeting. And so what we're talking about specifically here is geofencing, which mm -hmm. is setting up like a digital boundary around a location using GPS coordinates. Mm -hmm. And you can do it. I mean, I've done it. You can do it down to the foot. Wow. So typically a really good example that I always tell people is if you're going to like target a lot of company and you have a coupon app on your phone. What's going to happen is as soon as you go through the doors to Target, they're going to be pounding you with all kinds of different stuff because they know you're at Target and this app knows that you're shopping and looking for deals. So that's, you know, what's going to happen. Even Target, Target's own app will do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's other examples, too, that you can do. Uh, you can set a geofence yourself. If you have the Google Assistant, you can just say, hey, Google, next time I'm at Target, you know, remember to buy ham. And it knows when you walk into Target, it'll say, you know, don't forget to buy ham. Mm -hmm. That's basically it. You're 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 going to cross this boundary with the with the, this geo fence and it will start sending you advertisements based on what your specific location is. And and it seems to me just right now, listening to what you're saying, retargeting is sort of like the geo fencing in the digital world, maybe. Definitely. Well, that there's there's different ways to retarget and and situation specific targeting is the same kind of thing. But retargeting is based on uh, behavior with your website. So you would say it's going to throw a cookie in your browser, which is just like a little kind of a digital flag, I guess. Right. Anytime, anytime there's a spot to show an ad where you go after visiting my website or specific pages on my website, you're going to see them. Okay. If you want a real good example of this, go to Amazon, put a bunch of stuff in your cart and then leave and they'll follow you everywhere saying, Hey, don't forget, don't forget to check out. Right. Uh, I actually, I actually follow some, uh, intellectual property lawyers on Twitter. And when they do research for clients and products and stuff, they do it in Amazon and then they get followed around by these products that they didn't buy, but they were just doing research on. So, and they kind of, are kind of, you know, fist shake into the sky, like quit following me. And, and that's a, that's a really good example of more situation specific kind of what I'm talking about, because that can be, you know, location based or, mm. um, you know, if you're, you know, you check into a, a restaurant and it might give you an ad for, you know, 10% off that meal to support your, or, you know, 10% of your bill tonight goes to support your local uh, sports team. If you use this coupon, um, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But another situation specific thing is people who bought this 
also bought these mm. or you know you were looking at this you might also be interested in this mm. so that brings into a bigger thing where they're they're storing these behaviors using amazon as as an example where they're taking these buying patterns or this this database of what people did and what they purchased and and laying it all together and and trying to make these predictions and targeting people who have similar interests using that stored information. And, and I think that's sort of where we start to get into, um, well, some of the, the different, you know, social media stuff, but, uh, you know, what, what we're really looking at here just to, to, you know, keep it on the, the more location specific stuff is geofencing and, and that type of targeting. So let's move on. Um, you know, in the hot take, we talked about geofencing, personal injury lawyers, geofencing ERs. What, what's the big deal? You know, if you're just showing people who are in situations or locations that make them more likely to need legal services or, or be more responsive to a legal ad, how is that ethically questionable for lawyers? I mean, it, it, Besides just being creepy, <laughs> <laughs> because marketers and advertisers are down for creeping. Um, it, like that, that's I, I wanted to bring up the example of loyalty cards and programs. Everyone has those at all of your supermarkets. They are following everything. And we are kind of cool with that. You give me some great coupons and then I can go into the store. And so data harvesting has been happening for a long, long time. What makes geofencing in particular just ethically questionable? I think it's what you're talking about fencing. You know, mm. like what the, the examples, you know, we just talked about, whether you're talking about a store. I mean, I'm going to a store to buy stuff. We're talking about targeting people uh, in adverse situations, maybe targeting people based on a location where you know they're going to be it, facing some circumstances where they're going to need legal help. How far of a line into their privacy are you willing to cross? Mm. That's when, when we're talking about this ethically, uh, we're not talking about selling toilet paper. You know, we're talking about somebody who got seriously injured. We're talking about maybe medical conditions mm -hmm. in a subconscious way, maybe implying some kind of knowledge there that I know you're in trouble. You know, mm. if you're seeing this ad and depending on what the ad is, it, it depends on what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, but oh, yeah. Is it right to be targeting the waiting room of an ER? Is that an OK place? Because you sure as heck couldn't walk in there and start handing out business cards, could you? No. Or 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 uh, snacks or donuts. You know, I mean, it 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 just seems weird. There's something that has kept lawyers extremely conscious of this anti ambulance chasing vibe. And geofencing somehow lets us off the hook. Like, I'm not chasing the ambulance. I'm just chasing where the ambulance is going. <laughs> so it's just like, it's one more level. But ethically, it's gray. And public perception of lawyers is definitely being damaged. I would, I think, could have a negative connotation. I think you're right. I think there's also a bit of a leap here that people are even going to be seeing these ads. Mm -hmm. Put it this way. If you were targeting the entire city, someone would probably be in the ER and chances are they'd see your ad. You know, it could happen anyway. So I can see where people might be like, well, I mean, whatever. I'm just narrowing my targeting to try and, you know, get the most out of my advertising. I think there's also a philosophical side to this maybe mm -hmm. where maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Maybe you shouldn't be, um, you wouldn't have like a sign flipper standing over a bridge on the expressway. And, right? and, and, <laughs> you know? and that's, that's why I think digital advertising gives us this sort of cloak of binary code that mm -hmm. we can kind of like behave a little bit differently, a little bit, you know, more loose, playing yes. it loose with those kind of <laughs> ethics, those morals. We're not breaking any laws. No right. way are we breaking right. laws. Um, right. but, but yeah, there is a philosophical question. Um, and cause I was at a law firm and we did this and I, I, we didn't get any clicks from it. I remember kind of feeling a little bit, uh, leery about going into that. 
You're a terrible person, Jake. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I've done it uh, back when I was more in, in the uh, digital ad space. Uh, we definitely tried it. Um, mm-hmm. We tried all kinds of different geo fences. Well, now here's a question. Was it, uh, was there any success there? No. Hmm. I, nothing, nothing that I ever trace back to it, no. It could be just a, another example of, oh, no, we just wanted to try it. We're just testing things. But if you keep trying on all the latest gadgets, it seems like you you may be missing the point. But so let's move on. What about social media? If we're talking about privacy and data mining, that's been happening on Facebook and Twitter. But there's also been manipulation of behavior, uh, you know, 500 and 83 like million accounts were deleted in the mm. first three months of 2018. That's half a billion people. Quote people. <laughs> Quote people. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just wondering what, what about that issue? Uh, you know, I mean, if someone posts on Facebook or Twitter that they're visiting grandma in a nursing home, why wouldn't we show them an ad for nursing home abuse cases? It, it It's a business decision, isn't it? It ends up being like, hey, if you want to try it, we can try it. And and that's why I think this this digital advertising has this, it's this gray area that we're totally okay with kind of like playing it, you know, fast and loose. And, and I think with the, with the social media, it, 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 there is a larger thing here of, you know, people should understand that if you're using a platform like Facebook or Twitter or something like that, it's free. That means, you know, the old saying, mm-hmm. you know, if, if something's free, you're the product, mm-hmm. you know, people are connecting the dots with what you like, where you log in, where you check in, where your location is on your phone, what the messages are on Facebook, all that stuff is going into this big soup pot and people are cooking up, you know, ads just for you. Mm-hmm. Now, at a certain point, I think there's kind of like the social, I don't know that you can call it a like a digital social contract, but I think there are certain lines that you probably shouldn't cross with regards to that. If somebody posts that their spouse passed away, you shouldn't be showing them ads for wrongful death. Mm-hmm. I mean, that I think is invasive. Mm-hmm. Is it legal? Sure. Can you do it? Sure. Do I think it's right? No. You know, we see all these bar surveys that say lawyers have this terrible perception, you know, and it's their ads and stuff like that. Well, these are the kind of decisions that you need to be thinking about that would affect that kind of stuff. Stay tuned as we continue on a very special episode of Lawson. As far as like capturing information and following folks from a marketing standpoint, it's amazing. From a consumer standpoint, it's kind of scary. It's kind of creepy. I've been in conversations. Once you start incorporating marketing and advertising philosophies and you really want to grow your business, you really want to expand, you you want to be that growth hacker, you start to have less of those philosophical doubts and you have more of a will it work or won't it work and could it be effective and how much will it cost? And, and it, and it kind of removes itself away from this kind of contentious area where lawyers have been saying the public perception of the law is damaged. Well, and that, you know, you make a really, really good point right there, Jake, that it's not a lot of times it's a more gradual erosion. Right. I don't know that people are just immediately like, let's target funeral homes. But you start off thinking, okay, well, we're going to use contextual targeting. So we're going to have display ads show on pages on the internet that have text copy about fighting the insurance company on your own mm-hmm. or how to you know work with the insurance company after your car was totaled. Seems like legit places to show an ad for an injury law firm. But the next step is, well, they were on this web page. Let's let's we can go anywhere. What if they're on this web page in an emergency room waiting room? 
that's even better, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, so you're starting to stack these things on and it's not necessarily a conscious thing of like, I want to just start running ads to people who are sitting in the waiting room of an emergency room. It's we're already running ads. We're already on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We're already doing these things. Mm -hmm. Let's just try this out. Yes. And like you say, there's this cloak, there's this digital cloak where I'm not on TV. You know, I'm not running this commercial. No one's really even going to know. Right. You know, even if it comes back, you could just be like, well, I mean, we're just, I thought we were targeting a whole city. I mean, I'm sorry. Right. And that kind of goes into this uh, apologizing. Uh, we talked earlier today about how many apologies are coming from big companies lately. Oh, the apology commercials. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah. Just, I'm just so sorry. We're so sorry. Uh, your privacy means everything to us, you know? And, and, you know, it's like, you don't want to give yourself a reason to apologize, you know, because you don't think you're going to get caught. None of these companies thought that what they were doing was against anything. And indeed, when Cambridge Analytica and all that kind of Facebook stuff came out, there was a shriek of joy inside of my marketing heart because you're <laughs> like, oh, my God, well, we can psychologically profile people. Now I know you're a little bit open or, or, or you're closed off or you're neurotic or you're totally extroverted, introverted. So that can help me in the way that I market my product to you. And I say, oh, this lemon soap is great for people who <laughs> never get out of the house. I, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I would be able to know psychologically what my customers were thinking so I could give them better ads. But that's not what's happened. <laughs> we're, we're not just stopping at granola. We're not just stopping at products. We're moving into ideology. We're moving mm. into things that can destroy societal bonds, things that can be manipulated. It's a dangerous place. But I think success becomes what you measure. And if you're measuring engagement on social media, you'll start playing this game and you won't even know when you've mm -hmm. gone on the other side of ethical, philosophical, um, that the other side of that digital social contract that we were talking about, which I think is great. You know, I think that, that Cambridge Analytica is a, is a very good example of this, this data being used to manipulate things right being used to push information that people want to be seen more as opposed to what you know people might think is an unbiased news feed mm -hmm. um, and i mm. think once you start to manipulate things in a way that is influencing people to make choices based on false information that's when you're starting to get into trouble. And you may think we're talking about some political discussion, but this option has been available for any advertiser to do the same thing that, that these folks have done, but they pushed ideology. So there, there's, there's, an, there's an option, and a lot of people think advertising is this manipulative thing. You're getting people to buy stuff that they don't want. Um, you're showing ads to people that they don't want to see them. Um, mm. and it doesn't matter really how good the advertisement is. If, sup if nobody wants it, they're not going to buy it. Right. So th that that's different for products and services. But if there's some hint inside of your head that maybe you don't trust the people coming into the country, I'm not saying that they're all bad. You know, it's just all they have to do is put a hint in there. And if I'm a product marketer, all I need to do is put a hint in there that you need deodorant. I'm not <laughs> saying you need deodorant. All I need to do is put a hint. So my general animosity towards this is that the same thing that works for marketing and advertising has been co-opted by bad actors pushing ideology that destroys. But they're doing the same thing that advertisers have been doing and been really hopefully that they could do on behalf of their products and brands. But they're actually ruining the ability. I mean, it's like... Facebook is a great thing. I've I've been a part of advertising campaigns that were wildly successful on Facebook. I've also been part of advertising campaigns that were flops, beyond flops, filled with frauds and fake accounts and everything. So I've I've seen it positive, I've seen it negative, but I think this whole uh data privacy, this targeting thing, now now that personal injury lawyers are being outed as geofencing, using third-party data to invade people's privacy to show them ads. I, the free ride is, is coming to an end. Have you ever had questions about about a campaign? 
Have you ever had like, I, like, should, should I be doing this? Should I be using this targeting method? Display advertisements. I went through a big, a big existential crisis <laughs> as far as display ads were concerned. <laughs> um, because I did some research and, and, you know, I realized we have had success, uh, you know, at, at my old law firm, we had great success. Um, but it was that smaller on the hundredth side of the percentile. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's where it is. It's 0.003%. And that's pretty mm -hmm. solid, you know? Yeah. So, so we were, we were pumped for those things. But a as I started to realize that, you know, a Mercedes ad is running on an ISIS beheading on YouTube, you know, and, and Mercedes is like, wait, what? I'm sorry. Wait, hold on. And they pulled all of their ads and then AT&T pulled all their ads. And then uh, all these people started pulling their ads from YouTube because there was a brand safety concern. Mm -hmm. And that started the kind of unthreading of this giant gameable system because we were all dancing to the algorithms, you know, mm, but, but right. once somebody could figure out how to handle those algorithms, once again, that cloak is, is raised the binary cloak of digital um, secrecy. What I ended up coming to the realization with display ads was that the display ads were only as powerful as what I was writing, as what I was creating, as the ad itself. Because I think a lot of people are just like, just throw an ad out there, say, call me, boom. And that's it. That's even, that's probably even better than a lot of the ads I see. Call me, <laughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are wasting time, but really to me, it brought me back down because I was chasing like, oh, should we do digital? Should we do display? Should we retarget? Should we geofence? Should we geotarget? Should we target target? Should we just target target people who go to target? I had to stop and remove myself from that. And I realized that what I needed to focus on was advertising and making a really compelling ad, writing a good ad, creating a good something eye catching because banner blindness, people don't see ads online. If they have ad blockers, you could have the best ad in the world. They'll never see it. And it doesn't matter. And, and ad blocker is the, the number one downloaded app. So lawyers looking into digital marketing, um, thinking that they won't have to jump over that or they can just you know slide some ads to some poor people who can't afford an ad blocker. Um, mm -hmm. It's not, it's not going to be like that because you're damaging the public perception of law. You're writing a bad ad and then you're investing in – Shady advertising targeting practices. Yeah. The big thing for me with some of these targeting methods, I I also went through the the existential thing, but uh, it was with, with regards to programmatic, right? Mm. So you've got, you know, programmatic advertising now. A, a quick summary is yeah. they say there's so many placements available on the internet, internet, so many places that you can, you know, put an ad. Millions, millions and millions available oh, yeah. per second. Oh, yeah. And they're all dumped out onto these these open impressions are available to buy. So no one person could actually manage all this. So what they do is they get an AI and machine learning and these companies develop their own algorithms and they do this targeting based on data they've collected. <laughs> so wow. That's kind of the thing where you're like, well, how do you? target people who are likely to be in a car accident or were, you know, like, I don't even know. I don't know that I want to ask that question. And I think if I feel that way, then it should be sending up, you know, some, some flags. Right. 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 And I, I think a lot of lawyers are approaching advertising already with a little bit of hesitation because right. ethical considerations, bar restrictions, uh, a, a lot of, a lot of States have, pretty dialed in codes on mm -hmm. what you can say. You can't say you're an expert. You can't say this, you know, you have to be very careful about the way you present information. So a lot of people end up making an ad that is just beige, you know, it's just like, it's just for everybody. Um, so it's for no one. For me, I guess this whole, this whole thing kind of boils down to how can our listeners like, what are they supposed to do with all this? There's all these options for digital advertising. There's ethical considerations. There's some gray area, more gray area to come than I think we've ever faced. What are some of our recommendations for, for the audience right now? What could they do? Uh, first thing I would say is stop chasing every new thing that comes out. <laughs> right. Geofence this and we're going to, you know, geotarget this. 
every new thing that comes out, it's it's you're just going to be like a dog chasing its tail. Right. It's it, you have to be consistent. It has to be part of a larger strategy. So I would say don't be so enamored by shiny objects. Mm -hmm. But as part of that, these kind of things are OK if you approach it from a more uh, analytical perspective. You should, you should part of, you know, you should be okay with testing some of these things. If, you know, it lines up with your ethics and your business strategies, that testing should be part of your larger marketing strategy. Mm. And you should set parameters with these things and say, okay, we're going to spend X amount on trying this type of targeting out and we're going to let it run for 30 days. And you're going to go back and look at your data because no matter what you're doing, the larger sense, whether it's, you know, SEO, social media, whatever, you should always be going back and looking at your data. And that should be your guide as to what's working and what's not. Working. Yeah. And, and our, the audience obviously knows how we feel about geofencing, but we did it and we've completed it and we jumped through and we took a look at the analytics and it, and it doesn't work. Is there a business case here for someone to do geofencing, hyper-targeting, retargeting, marketing, all that stuff? Yeah, there, there, there is. And I'm not going to tell you no, but I think Paul's, it's a wonderful kind of a reductive moment where let's cease some of this activity and focus on the core mentality of how we approach advertising rather than approaching it all the time. Definitely. And it's just a bigger thing. I mean, your, yeah. your advertising should be in line with your brand and your, your website and your stuff mm -hmm. online. I mean, all mm -hmm. these things, all these kind of different pieces should be working together as opposed to just having this little offshoot of like, well, you know, we're, we're all in on geofencing. Like, you know, it's, it's probably not a great idea. So Lawson is a, a podcast from consult webs and they're, and our company does digital marketing for lawyers, but we've been doing it for 20 years. And so we're totally aware of this ecosystem that your advertising, digital advertising and marketing lives within. So I would suggest people follow this podcast on social media, follow consult webs on social media, subscribe to that newsletter. Me and Paul, all we do all day is talk about marketing for lawyers and, and advertising. You can see that we have opinions about this. Um, so start following people who, who are speaking about this intelligently and not just telling you to chase things. You know, I think you need to find somebody who you can trust. Um, and this podcast is, is one of them. I mean, we've done it when we're we've honest it, about it. Well, know? yeah, sure. Hey, I think it's bad. I've also done it. Mm -hmm. So there's something there to have some honesty and to have it come from a vendor that you can trust and, and get those insights, you know, regularly could help you create that consistent marketing profile. All right. Well, let's head to 10 questions. Paul, you're in the hot bench. All righty. Let's do it. Ten questions we ask everyone. Okay. Are, is everybody ready? I'm ready. Paul, you ready? I'm loose. I feel good. All right. Here we go. Ten questions we ask everyone featuring Paul Julius. Uh, what was the last book you read? Notes from a Small Island by Bill Bryson. Oh, I like that guy. What's your best habit? I eat a banana every day. <laughs> Nicely done, sir. I hear they have radiation in them, too. I mean, whatever it does, it's working. <laughs> I know. I'm loving that. I get that glow, that banana glow. <laughs> is that what that is? <laughs> uh, here's number three, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, or none of the above? Twitter, for sure. Totally. Coffee or tea? Uh, coffee. I would mainline it if I could. I know, without a <laughs> doubt. What, what is your, what's your favorite place? I think about this every time I ask guests this question mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I don't know, I, I'm going to have to cheat because I have, I have a favorite place that is a destination mm -hmm. and a favorite place where I look around and I'm like, Oh, I'm in my favorite place. Nice. Um, so my, my favorite place as a destination was Liverpool. Liverpool was totally cool. I, it was it blew me away. Like if you're a Beatles fan, you know, that's where it all happened. That's um, awesome. but even if you're not a Beatles fan, there's just all kinds of, 
Got to contact the Liverpool Tourism Board for more. Yeah, really, what's going Go on here? Your local library, sorry. <laughs> um, was, <laughs> yeah, they're totally paying me, man. Um, my other favorite place, though, which is which is some place I can get to a little more frequently than Liverpool, is in the kitchen cooking with my wife. That makes sense. What do you do? Are are you like more of a sous chef, or are you more of like the the hat? Um, you know, sometimes it depends on what we're making. And I think that's really fun is that there isn't any, there's, there's no, you're the cook and I'm the cleaning crew or, you know, whatever. Like sometimes it's her, like she makes it best. And I'm literally just sitting there holding the recipe book. Um, Mm -hmm. other times like there's prep work and stuff like that. It's just, we just kind of fall into this easy rhythm where the work itself and whatever you're doing is, uh, just kind of a kind of a cool way to 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 spend time and and still you know we've been married for a long time and it's just kind of a cool way to to still connect. Number six is Keanu Reeves, a good actor. Yes, not just a good actor. I know one of the best actors. I, we're gonna change that question. I know. <laughs> is Keanu Reeves the best actor? Is what it? Should be. I mean, I don't know. I, I, he does seem to get into this this kind of the same kind of roles. That's but that's what I'm saying. That's his power is that he brings a hundred percent Keanu. But I mean, people look at like like John Wick, right? And and those action sequences. If you're not an action movie and you're like, okay, you know, there's too much gun violence and everything. I get it. But totally, you know, just the fact that he went through all this training to make it. It wasn't that like he was just doing movie shooting or whatever. He was doing like the actual thing, reloading his gun jammed. I mean, stuff like that. I don't know. I don't see a lot of other people doing it. So, I mean, I know we kind of throw this question in here to, to throw people off, but I think, you know, I think the guy's legit. Employment. Number seven. What was your first job, Paul? Paper route. I had a paper route. Were you on a bike? No, I had like a, oh God. No, I had a, like a, like kind of like a wheelbarrow sort of thing. And I hated, I hated that job too. <laughs> <laughs> you had to get up at like five o'clock in the morning. It was awful. What is a skill you have outside of your current occupation that you incorporate into your work? Humor. I think, is that a skill or is that just a trait? Um, uh, I think it's a skill. I think a lot of people um, are f- fail at that skill. I've seen a lot of bad jokes. Um, yeah. I think maybe it'd, it'd be humor or cre- creative humor. <laughs> maybe that would be it. Um, I think, I think, that I like to laugh. Like, uh, you know, I was talking about in the kitchen, you know, with my wife, I mean, we're always making jokes with so many, you know, inside jokes and stuff that make right. each other giggle. I think that's just another way in a broader sense to connect with people. And whether that's casually at work or in a larger sense of trying to write an ad that's going to connect with people. If you can make someone laugh, they're going to remember that. So I think yeah. that's, uh, that might be it. That's a good one, man. Number nine. What sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? I would say PPC Hero, I still check in with. Brad Geddes, I still check in with. I like Ad Age. I like checking in with mm-hmm. uh, all those guys on my Twitter feed a lot. Subscribe to a lot of those guys on Twitter. So I would say, as, as, I, as I warn everyone not to do, my, I get a lot of stuff from my social media feed. So <laughs> It's not a warning. It's just kind of a, a reality. Well, I think it depends too. You know, when we're talking news, you know, like I'm going to Chicago Tribune or CNN. Oh yeah. Like, I'm not like, I'm not looking in my Twitter feed and being like Kim Kardashian's what? Oh, I'm totally not. <laughs> um, you know, but for more like industry news, I think looking at, at, you know, your, your social media is pretty legit because everybody in the industry that you and I are in are doing social media, you know? So so we made it to the end, number 10, mm-hmm. after a long day or a long week at work. How do you relax and unwind? Um, I like to put on my headphones and fall down the rabbit hole of music on YouTube, I guess. Uh, you know, we did, we did, we just did this whole episode about people collecting data on you, <laughs> but I've had some really great suggestions from you, like this rocks. All right. Well, uh, thanks. You passed. Woo. Awesome. All right. That wasn't so bad. That was easy. For show notes, links, and info, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or go to www.consultwebs.com slash Lawson Podcast. 
Be sure to leave us a review and ratings on iTunes or wherever you find the c*** you listen to. Until next week, stay awesome.